It must have been clear to all the apostles at the end of Matthew chapter 23 that when they were leaving the environment of the temple upon that day, they were leaving it forever in one sense. After the language that the Lord had used in Matthew chapter 23, excoriating and criticizing the Jews so heavily as he had done, there was really no hope that they might be able to repair that kind of a breach. There was no hope that they might be able to come together after those kind of speakings that he had done in Matthew chapter 23. And so the apostles must have known when they were beginning to leave the temple at the end of Matthew 23, that they were leaving it in one sense forever. And one of the apostles, matter of fact, all of the apostles, still clung with their loving pride to that symbol of their nationalism, that temple, which was one of the ancient wonders of the world. And we are told at the beginning of Mark 13, the parallel passage, that one of them was to call our Lord's attention to the beautiful buildings of the temple, the ornateness of its decorations, because indeed the temple was a fabulous, fabulous structure. It was, as mentioned, one of the ancient wonders of the world. The platform upon which the temple was built occupied about 40 football fields. Herod the Great had actually broadened the base of Mount Moriah in order to build the gigantic walls surrounding the temple. There were nine beautiful gates by which you might gain entrance or access into the courtyards within. One of them is today called Robinson's Arch, named after the archaeologist who discovered it, which is on the southwestern corner of the temple. And it had a huge archway over the top of the Teropian Valley, which was in the center of Jerusalem, running north and south. And you could walk over that arched gateway, or arched ro roadway, stepway, and enter into the temple high up on the mountain. And the nine gates, all of them were gilded with gold and silver. Over each of the gateways was a huge cluster of grapes, so huge that they were as large as a man. One of them was made of solid Corinthian brass, and it was more expensive than all the rest. And once you entered into the gates, you would come into the court of the Gentiles. That would be the court where they were allowed to go, and only there, no further. It was richly paved with mosaic all over it. You would go through archways and gateways and 14 steps up more into the court of the women. That would be the only place that the women could go. That is, that is as far as they were able to go. And then you would enter once again through 12 more steps up to the court of the priest, which is higher level still. And then in the center of it all, just as you see in the picture, there was the temple itself which you accessed, or the priest would access, by nine more steps. The rabbis were so proud of it, they said it was like a crouched lion on top of a mountain. Or, as one of them put it, from a distance, looking at the hills, at it from the hills of the north, they said it was like a snowy summit gilded by the sun. Truly one of the great wonders of the ancient world. But to our Lord... The beauty of the temple was not found in its furnishings. It was not found in the gold and silver that gilded it. It was found in the heart, the sincerity of the worshipers that went into its gates. It was not in all of the fabulous furnishings and the money that Herod had spent. It was in the sincerity of the people who came there to worship. That was the beauty of the temple. And he makes a terse statement to the apostles. He said, you see these stones here? There's coming the day in which one stone is not going to be left upon another that will not be cast down. And from that day, 35 years later, Jerusalem would be completely in ashes and the temple would be completely demolished. And with that statement that he made pertaining to the one stone not left upon another, he turns on his heel and he begins to exit the city of Jerusalem. As they go out the city of Jerusalem, out the eastern walls of the temple area, they descend immediately down a steep hillside. A footpath takes you right down to the Kidron Brook, which is a small stream in the Kidron Valley. Crossing it, you go right up through the Garden of Gethsemane. 
A steep footpath leads you right up the Mount of Olives. And then we're told at the top of the Mount of Olives, according to the text, all of the apostles and the Lord stopped to rest. Perhaps at this time, resting under the shade of one of those stately cedars, which are no longer there, they stopped and they turned around and they looked at the city of Jerusalem. And before them was the city that had now become a harlot. Behind them, you could see even from this vantage point, the purple line of mountains that form the mountains of Moab. One of the rabbis would say, it glowed like a chain of jewels in the sunset light. And below that, where you could not barely see, the Judean hills, they were bare, desolate, and at the very bottom of those Judean hills was the lowest spot on the crust of the earth, the Dead Sea, whose ghastly and bituminous waves still speak against God's vengeance against homosexual crime. And the disciples now creep forward with a question because there's one thing on their mind, and that is, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when these things are about to occur? That is, the destruction of the temple and the city, as he had predicted. Now, that's how Mark and Luke both give us the rendition. Two questions. When shall these things be? And what shall the sign, or the be the sign, when these things are about to come to pass? Matthew divides the second question into two portions. He says, the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. Apparently, they thought perhaps the Lord would be the one who would bring the vengeance, which indeed he would do. But be that as it may, they did not have really the idea of the Lord's departure and second coming at all. They had no idea regarding that. And they're interested in when will these things occur? And what are the signs when these things are about to occur? Our Lord gives it in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And he gives it in a series of signs which we might simply summarize by saying that they are to watch, they are to beware, they are to pray, and they are to flee. Flee the city. As a matter of fact, he tells us in Luke 21, one of those parallel texts, when you see Jerusalem accomplished with armies, flee. You know that our desolation is at hand. Let not them that are in Judea go into the city. Let not them that are in the midst of her, let them that are in the midst of her depart out. Let not them that are in the country enter therein. For these are the days of vengeance when all things that are written may be fulfilled. Verse 24 tells us, these are the times of the Gentiles, or the city will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The destruction of the city. But regarding the second coming, that is another day. Another time, our Lord changes the course of his speech in Matthew 24, now telling us in Matthew 24, verse 36, of that day and of that hour knoweth no one, not the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. So what is a person to do? What were the disciples to do in preparation for the Lord's second coming? There were no signs that were to be given, all the signs in the New Testament are signs of the destruction of Jerusalem. There are no signs. It was simply this, verse 44. Watch therefore. You don't know the day or the hour. Watch therefore. What exactly does that mean? What are we to do? How are we to watch? What is involved in watching for the Lord's second coming? Well, as one day would turn into weeks and weeks, into years and years, into decades and decades, into centuries, the apostles would die in the first century, and Christians would still consider and wonder, what am I to do to prepare for the Lord's second coming? What are we to do? And the instruction is very, very simple. Watch, therefore, for you know not the day nor the hour. But our Lord does give us three spectacular parables to illustrate the point. One of them is the peril of a drowsy life. That's the end of Matthew 24. Number two is the peril of a smoldering lamp. That is the parable of the ten virgins, which we looked at recently. And then number three, the peril of an unused talent. And so we begin the read in Matthew chapter 25, and it will begin in verse 14. 
For it is as when a man going into another country called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his several ability, and he went on his journey. Straightway, therefore, he that had received the five talents went and traded with him, made five other talents. Likewise, he that received the two talents went and gained other two. But he that received the one talent went away, digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. Now after a long while, the Lord of those servants returns and makes a reckoning with them. Makes a reckoning. That is, a day of reckoning is coming. And he that had received the five talents came and brought five other talents and said, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents, so I've gained other five. He said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set thee over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He that had received the two talents came and brought other two and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two talents. Lo, I've gained other two. He said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will set thee over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. But he that received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter. I was afraid. I went away and hid your talent in the earth, and lo, you have your own. The Lord answered and said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I'm a hard man, reaping where I sowed not, gathering where I did not scatter. You ought us therefore to have put my money to the bankers. At my coming I would have received back mine own with interest. Take away the talent from him. Give it unto him that has the ten talents. For unto every one that has it shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that has not it shall be taken away, even that which he has. And cast you out the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The peril of an unused talent. The truth of the parable, first and primary, is that there are different amounts of talents, but we are all equal in responsibility. Each of us have a different amount of talents, but we're equal in responsibility to the Lord. One of the great truths of the parable, and it is also reflective of life, is that we are not all equal in talents. One was five, one had two, another had one. The question might be asked, well, what is a talent exactly? We're told at the beginning of the parable that a talent was given, or talents were given, to each according to his several abilities. So it would not be simply abilities, but I would say that abilities plus opportunities plus the resources, that's what equals a talent. A talent is the abilities, the resources, the opportunities that we all have. And the truth of the parable and the truth of life is that they are different among men. That is a truth that our modern society has forgotten and has despised because of the socialistic style of government that we live in. And that is, the government takes from some and gives to the other. Now, there are several things absolutely wrong with this, taking from some and giving to the other. Number one, it is theft. It is wrong. It is immoral. It's just as immoral for the government to do it as if I were to put a gun in your face and say, I'm taking your money and I'm giving it to this person over here. That may be charity on this side of it, but it is theft on this side, isn't it? That's number one. And it has caused our entire country to collapse, morally speaking, because we have become an immoral people because we are led by an immoral government. Socialism is a moral system. Number two, and they think that, you know, we redistribute equally to everybody and therefore you're going to get away or do away with envy. We're going to do away with envy because there will not be an opportunity for one person to have more than another and the one with lesser will have now envy toward the one with more. And so they say we redistribute equally, we get rid of envy. But that's wrong also. Why? Well, if we redistribute everything equally today in this congregation alone or in this community alone, tomorrow it will be unequal. Why is that the case? 
Because some of you are wiser than others of us. Because if we redistribute equally today, you will invest wisely. You might save. I will spend mine frivolously. Tomorrow I'll have nothing. You'll have double. And now what? We're unequal again. Socialism overlooks the nature of men. And our Lord here tells us that it is not an equal distribution among men, period. That's the way life is. And so, unequal distribution. But, at the same time, we're all equal in responsibility. Equal in responsibility means that the one talent man, I don't need to look at a man with five talents and say, I'm jealous of the man who has five talents. I wish I could do that. And I wish it... No, I don't need to be jealous or envious of the man with five talents because had I five, I would not be able to handle them correctly. I would not be able to handle them wisely. The Lord has given to each person according as his ability. I would not be able to handle the talents that I wish that I had. God has given to me what he knows that I need and no more than I can handle. I'm just thankful the Lord has not required me to carry an ocean in a small water bucket. <laughs> and, you know, it reminds me of the story of a man walking on the beach in Florida, and he was watching a man fish, and so he stopped to watch him fish, and he's pulling out these fish out of the sea, and he pulled some big ones out, and he threw them back in. And then he pulled some medium-sized ones out, he put them in his little cooler, smaller ones out, put them in his cooler, and he just saw that for about an hour. He said, <clears throat> he said excuse me, um, why are you throwing the big ones back and keeping the small ones? He said, small frying pan. <laughs> well, I'm glad the Lord has not required me to cook big fish in a small frying pan. And the Lord has distributed as we each need. On the other hand, the one with five talents needs not to be boastful or haughty over a person with one talent because in the end, what have any of us that the Lord has not given us? What have I that the Lord has not blessed me with? What have you that the Lord has not blessed you with? There's no reason and no need for haughtiness. There's no need for snootiness when someone has more talents than another. We just need to be mindful of this fact that to whom much is given, what? Much is required. A parallel parable that we find in Luke chapter 12. To whom much is given, much is required. And let's note this also. Regarding guilt, do you know the one talent man who refused to use his talent in the parable is just as guilty as the five talent man would have been had he not used his talents? Now I say that because we frequently look at people and say, look at the talents that person is wasting. And I think there's some truth in that. It's a shame that people have the talents, the abilities, the resources, the opportunities, but they throw them away on themselves. Say, what? Why are they wasting all that talent? But there is just as much guilt attached to a one-talent person who does not utilize it for the Lord as a five-talent person who refuses to use his or her talents. The guilt is exactly the same. Because we are equal in responsibility. We're equal to the task that the Lord has given us. So different amounts of talents and we're equal in responsibility. I want to say something about the measurement and the standard. This parable brings out exceedingly clearly that there are different considerations brought into judgment. We are told, for example, in John chapter 12, verse 48, that we are all to be judged by the Word of God. At the last day, we will stand to the Word of God, John 12 and 48. He that rejects me receives not my saying, has one that judges him. The word that I spake... The same shall judge him in the last day. But, but, there are also different considerations brought into judgment as well. For example, James chapter 3 and verse 1 tells us, Don't be many of you teachers, because teachers will have heavier, that would be stricter judgment. A stricter judgment, that's a different measuring rod in some senses, that's a different consideration. How about this one in James 2 and verse 13? J judgment is without mercy to him that shows no mercy. If we are merciless to other people, then that's exactly how the standard will be applied to us. 
That's a different consideration brought into judgment, isn't it? We need to be merciful and thoughtful of other people. And when we fail to do that, when we refuse it, be sure of this, the Lord's going to apply it, this final standard, to us in the same way. How about this passage, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, that is, you put to other people, it shall be measured unto you again. How you judge other people is how God is going to judge us. Interesting, the Bible does not tell us, don't judge. A lot of people read the passage and say, well, it says, judge not. No, it doesn't say that. It says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. The Bible never says, don't make an assessment. But we better be sure to make the assessments with some mercy because that's the way we want it applied to us at the last. And so also it is regarding the talents that each has, that God has given us. That is, we will be assessed on how we have utilized our specific talent. That's how we'll be judged. That is, am I using what God has given me to do? Am I utilizing what talents, what abilities, what opportunities, what resources? God, am I doing? Am I doing that? Now, here's what happens. We say, when we look around and say, well, he's not doing anything in the church, or she's not doing anything. I'm not doing much, but they're not doing anything either. What are we doing? We're doing exactly what Paul said, don't do. 2 Corinthians 10 and 12, he says, don't judge yourselves by others with one another. That meant simply, don't make an assessment of yourself by what others are or are not doing. You are going to be judged by how well you have utilized what God has given to you to do. And that's a consideration that is brought into judgment. Am I doing what God has given me to do? Am I utilizing the opportunities, the abilities, the resources that God has blessed me with? That's how we're to be measured. One other point regarding measurement. Aren't you glad that it's the Lord who apply the measuring rod at the last and not my enemy? <laughs> you know, if my enemy were to, were to apply the measuring rod, I would not have much mercy, would I? I yeah, I have enemies. I, I, that's hard to believe. I know. I, I thought, wow. But that's right. Everybody has enemies. They say, well, they would not give you much mercy. They would not give you much leeway. And frankly, they would not receive much leeway from me if I were to make the application to them, would they? So we are thankful it's the Lord who makes the measurement. Utilize what God has given you. That's the measuring rod. Then let's notice this. You are left on your own to work. You are left on your own to work. You can work. You cannot work. You're free to work and you're free not to work. But be sure of this. You are not free to avoid the consequences of not working. You are not free to avoid the consequences of shouldering your own responsibility. Each individual must shoulder his or her own responsibilities before God. Now we have become frequently, too many times at least in the church, almost what I say programmed to death. That is, there's a program for this, a program for that. I'm a part of a program, the visitation or the prayer circle program, we might call it. But what happens and what the danger is is that unless we are plugged into a program, we are not going to be doing anything. We're not going to be doing it. We are responsible for the same work, whether I'm part of a program officially or not. It's simply and more enjoyable when we're connected with people in a program, but we're all responsible. We're left on our own to work. You're free to work and you're free not to work, but you're not free to avoid the consequences of not working. We must all labor. And so you're left on your own. Much responsibility comes with much latitude. There's not a detailed blueprint for everything in the Bible. There's a blueprint, to be sure, for worship, for other elements of Christian service. But regarding our Christian, for example, evangelism, is there a detailed blueprint on how we are to do it? No. No, we're not told exactly every step of the way to take, but... 
That is because there's freedom, there's liberty in Christ, but that brings what? Responsibility. You are responsible to do it. And so you're left on your own to work. But at the end of it, the last point comes to mind, and that is the Lord is going to return, and there will be a day of reckoning. You watch by working. I find this to be one of the most fascinating elements about human nature. And that is in the passages that we're looking at and considering this morning, there's so many people that want to spend their time looking at the signs that lead up to the, to the destruction of Jerusalem that the Lord talked about up to verse 34 of Matthew 24. And they want to apply those to today. And they spend their time in their study and they work out things with a map and a compass and think about how the time frame is all going to work out. And it really is not applicable to us today at all. And for us today, it is simply that you watch by working. So simple, and yet so difficult at one and the same time. Did you notice this also, that the one-talent man, he teaches us something. The one-talent man teaches us something. Teaches us a couple of things, actually. Number one, he teaches us that it's easy to blame other people, isn't it? Who did he blame? He blamed the Lord himself. I knew thee. You're a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter. That is, requiring what really was, did not belong to him. That's basically what he was saying. He was blaming the Lord for it. We are in this country all about blaming something else, some, the system. We're blaming racism. We blame sexism. We blame this. And we refuse to look at the real problem, and that is in the mirror. Me, me, I'm the problem. And we don't want to do that. And that's exactly what the one talent man did. I knew thee that thou art a hard man. So I was afraid. No. Now we're blaming someone else. Here's something else the one talent man teaches us. Did you hear what the Lord said to him at the very first? Thou wicked and slothful. I think the translation Brother Dan had was lazy Lazy servant. Wicked. Now we reserve the word wicked for some heinous crime, criminal act that is a black deed. That's how we reserve the word wicked. But here, the word wicked applies to those who simply refuse to do what the Lord wants us to do. That we are not laboring for the Lord. We're not working for the Master. And that is said to be, in our Lord's words, wicked and slothful. The one talent man teaches us something, what we need to avoid. We're to be busy in the kingdom and we watch by working. I think when the disciples heard all of this, they probably were confused about the entire lesson, perhaps. Don't know, but it was put down in words for us by Matthew who put it right there for us because as time went on, and the apostles would leave the earth, and then one generation after another would come and go. You cannot forget the simple lesson, you watch by working. Jesus made this comment in Matthew 26. Now, this is the chapter immediately succeeding where we are. He said to the disciples in verse 2, he said, It is two days, and the Son of Man is delivered up to be crucified. That was, of course, occupying their minds. And so now as they turn back toward the east, actually by the northeast, they would go to the city of Bethany where our Lord would stay night by night. And he wanted them to remember, and he wants you to remember, with these three parables, this one specifically, that we're to utilize our talent. Because it's the peril of an unused talent. And the lesson of the entire scope of it is there's a day of reckoning that is coming. My mother would like to say, use that language, there's a day of reckoning. You're going to give an answer to how you have behaved and what talents you have used and not used. The day of reckoning is approaching. Whether it is tonight, tomorrow, some other day, I don't know. But we have to be busy in the kingdom, watch by working. The lesson is yours. If you want to become a New Testament Christian by faith, repentance, baptism into Christ, that's the language of the New Testament, we want you to come to the front right now while we stand and sing if you're subject to the invitation.